Thank you all for being here this evening uh, with us at Wild Coachella. We're so happy you could make it. I'm Tamara Hedges, the Executive Director here at UCR Palm Desert Center. We are so pleased to have, to have Dr. Douglas Yanaga with us this evening from UCR's Entomology Research Museum. It's been a long day <laughs> with us. Uh, he, he's going to be our guide into the fascinating world of insects. And particularly, we're gonna be talking about beetles this evening. But before we jump into the presentation, I would like to give a very warm thank you to our generous UCR Palm Desert Center partners. Without your support partners, we would not be able to continue to offer these free programs to our community during even this surreal time, allowing us all to learn, discover, and grow together. So thank you partners for your ongoing support. We appreciate it. On behalf of all of us here at UCR, I would like to also respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Kuiya, the Tongva, the Lua Sueno, and the Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors, descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting space is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. A few little housekeeping items. Please use the chat to uh, communicate with us around anything that's not an official question for our speaker. So if you want to just let us know where you're zooming in from, we'd love to hear from you. Um, anything else, any other tidbits that you'd like to pass on to us, please, please do share in the chat. The Q&A uh, box there, you can load up any questions that you have at any time during the presentation. You don't need for the end uh, to the end of the presentation to pop those in there. And when um, Doug is finished with his talk, we are going to have Colin Barrows uh, facilitate our Q&A for us. Colin is one of our UCR Palm Desert Center California naturalists, and he's a climate steward and a volunteer with UCR Palm Desert and part of our Wild Coachella uh, planning committee. So thank you so much, Colin. Oh, video's not showing, so no one can see me? Hmm. Well, I'm going to keep talking, um, and hopefully you'll see the other speakers. Um, so, so Colin will be handling the, the, the Q&A. Um, which we really appreciate. And lastly, I just want to give a big thank you to all of those folks who are behind the scenes. Oh, thank you, Lily. Lily sees me. Hi. Hi, Lily. Those behind the scenes that work so hard, Agam Patel, who is our associate director. Uh, thank you, Agam, for all that you do. Maggie Downs, Kelly Irwin, and uh, Amy O'Neill. And a warm, big Hug of a thank you to Elizabeth Erickson, who is also our volunteer on the Wild Coachella Committee. Thank you for all that you do, Elizabeth. Now I'd like to turn it over to my friend and my colleague, Dr. Cameron Barrows. He is the a research ecologist with UCR Center for Conservation Biology. He heads up the Desert Studies Program here at the Palm Desert Center. And he is the lead instructor for California Naturalist program as well as our climate steward program. So without further ado, Dr. Barrows, take it away. Well, there. there I am. Okay, well, I, it is my pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Douglas Yanega. Um, he is the collections manager of UCR's research um, Entomology Museum, and the museum includes 4 million specimens, so, and he's in charge of every single one of those. So it's quite a job. You can see from the condition of this, his desk behind him, he's busy all the time. And you can imagine with 4 million specimens and questions coming in about insects from all over the university system and beyond, he's a busy, busy guy. Um, just to put in perspective what he's up against, if you think about lizards, which is what I study, there's 60 lizards in California. But if we go to reptiles, there's 108. If we go to birds, there's 450. If we go to plants, there's 5,500. And if we go to 
insects, which is um, Doug's um, expertise, 27,000 at least, and probably more than that. So that it's quite a task. And, and if you want to grow up to do something, to be busy all the time, this is the field you want to do. So Doug, take it away. Thanks very much, Cam. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation. The op it's a good opportunity to be able to talk to people and spread a little information. Um, when I was given the invitation originally, I had to think about it for not very long to decide what would be a good topic that would have people's interest um, for regional purposes and also for education um, just in general, because you know there are there are literally thousands of insect species that live in the Coachella Valley, and you know what which ones would be the ones to talk about, and I've picked three of them that each have a little bit of a story to tell and each give us a little bit of a lesson. That's why I called it the tale of three beetles. Um, it's you know a little bit of a nod to Dickens, but uh, we'll we'll we're not going to stick with that theme very much. Um, I will go over the biology and the a little bit of the history of these things because there's some there's some stuff that we can learn from each of those examples. Um, it is also along the lines of what Cam just said, um, a chance to get some insight into what actually goes on in terms of species discovery, which is something that a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate. He said, we have, oh, something on the order of 27,000 species of insects in California and there's bound to be more. Well, um, we here in the museum, um, that's there's just two of us who are full time, just between the two of us, we discover on average about 100 new species a year, just specimens that we have in our collection, of which a fair number are from California, although we have a lot of things from around the world. And that means that there's we're just scratching the, the proverbial tip of the iceberg when it comes to how many species are out there. There are a lot more species than you would imagine. And one of the first examples that I'm going to go to tonight is a good example of that particular problem. So for example, let me share my screen and we'll start with our first beetle. If I can get this um, done, do, do, share. This genus, Dynacoma. This is something that a few of you may be familiar with. Um, and there's this particular species that's from the Coachella Valley. This is Dynacoma casei. This is a, an interesting little beetle that lives in the wash there near the mouth of uh, Palm Desert. Um, and it's got an estimated between 500 and 600 acres where it occurs. And that's it. That's the only place on the planet where this particular beetle species lives. And so when people figure that out, um, that this was an issue, that it had such a small range, they decided that they would uh, try to get it listed as an endangered species and they were successful. So this is one of the very few insects that's on the federal endangered species list. And it is endemic to that one little plot of land right there at the, in the Palm Desert Wash. And it's just the tip of the iceberg, just as I was saying. Uh, that particular species is one of, well, originally there were only two described species in the genus. And then they added a third one last year, which is from over in Anzaborrego. So there's one from Coachella Valley, there's one from Anzaborrego, and then there's the original Dynacoma marginata, which is along the coast down in San Diego. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot more undescribed species that are in this genus. So these are not the only species of Dynacoma. They're not um, that unique. And so here is another species. I can give you a little bit closer view. That species in this box is one from Hemet. And you can see we have, a, this is a reasonable number of specimens of that. This hasn't been described yet. They've known about it for, oh, well over 20 years. These specimens are collected uh, mostly in the uh, 1990s, 1980s, 2000s. So 
there's another species of Dinocoma, and it's from, no, Hemet's not exactly Terra Incognita. And just in the course of doing research over this past year, the world authority on this group, who's a research associate in our collection, Dave Hawks, he's found eight additional new species. So we have a genus of beetles that has three described species and nine undescribed species. And that's a fairly big bug to be something that people hadn't come across before. And if you imagine that that's sort of the ratio of how many undescribed insects there are for every one that we actually know about, then the 27,000 species that we know of in California are probably just part of maybe you know close to 100,000 actual species that are here. And the other ones, we just haven't gotten around to finding them, collecting them, or if we have collected them, like, like these, um, we haven't described them yet. So there's, there's a lot to be done with their, these things. And that's one of the lessons that this particular beetle teaches us, is that when we think we know something, we're only scratching at the surface. So we've got uh, this one particular beetle in the Coachella Valley, and it's got relatives scattered around. So there's one over near Joshua Tree. There's another undescribed one right, whoops, where'd it go? Right there. You see where that map is? I don't know if you can see that too well, but that's up in between Morongo Valley and Yucca Valley, and that's not Dinocoma casei. That's another undescribed species, and there's more. So there's a whole bunch of other undescribed species in this genus that are out there. And it, what's worth knowing is that they're all very, very limited geographically. They all occur in washes or um, alluvial pans where the, where the ground has got a fairly high water table and they all have flightless females. And so they don't disperse very well. They've presumably got to where they're at in an you know, post-glacial periods or you know, thousands and thousands of years in the past, and they've become increasingly isolated from one another over the millions of years, and they've become separate species in each of these washes. And so each one of them has a very tiny geographic area that they occur in, and where you find them, they're super abundant. So you can go out and in one night see hundreds or thousands of individuals flying around, but they're only active for a short period of the year. And once they're gone, you know, you won't see them again until that time the next season. And so we have an interesting situation. These are insects who you can't kill them or eat them or do anything. You know, predators can't put a dent in their populations and yet they only occur in a very small area. And so it raises sort of a, a problem for people to contend with. And that's one of the issues about how endangered species legislation works and how we should be thinking about these sorts of problems. It's not necessarily a matter for protecting individual insects. And that's something that people tend to get confused between how insects work versus things like birds. If you kill an individual bird, you have put a really big dent in their population, generally speaking. If you kill an individual insect, they're usually the kind of things that can lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs over their life cycle. So you haven't done very much by killing an individual insect. The only reason that insects tend to go extinct is because of habitat loss. And that is something to be concerned about. And it really, if we, had, if we had had a little bit more foresight when the Endangered Species Act was created, that probably would have been the direction to go, is that we would have set up the protocols so it would preserve pieces of land that contain rare and unusual species and keep those pieces of land from being developed without having to necessarily make it just a crime to kill the individual organism. You, you, what you do is you prevent people from developing the place that they live. And most of the places that these beetles, the Dinocoma, live, including the Palm Desert Wash, are probably 
pretty safe from being developed. I mean, a the middle of a river wash is not, generally speaking, prime real estate for doing any sort of development projects or anything, except if people are working on, you know, doing stream reconstruction or stuff. But these are, generally speaking, stream beds that are dry most of the year. And in certain years, they're dry the entire year. So we don't necessarily have things right, but we're trying to do our best. So some, sometimes the kind of protection that you give, it, give an organism is less than ideal for the situation, but that's what we're contending with with these particular beetles. So that's the example of Dynacoma and the lesson that it has to teach us. There's a lot that we don't know. And there's, you know, when you don't know a lot about a species, knowing how to protect it isn't always the easiest thing either. So as for the second one of our tails, I'd like to move on to this particular beetle, which I also have some specimens of. Some of you may be familiar with this. This is the giant palm borer. This is Dinopede right eye. This is a species that occurs in the Coachella Valley, feeds on various palms, and that is a pretty big beetle. Um, you can compare to the other beetle that I was looking at, that other scarab. And if you compare to the size of my finger, um, you know, those are, those are pretty robust beetles. There are collectors in Japan who will pay good money for these because that's a very popular hobby in Japan. And these are the world's largest members of their family. Most of the members of this family are about one fifth as long as the uh, specimens of uh, Dinopede right eye. So that is a very large beetle. And this thing, as the name implies, feeds on palms. And certain people would like to have it classified as a pest. And the question is, is it really a pest? Well, in most years, if the palm trees are healthy and everything's fine, these beetles are very hard to come by. Um, they're very rarely seen. You don't find them in large numbers and they don't have a very big population. And they don't do very much damage. But under certain circumstances, they can become a problem. And the funny thing is that those circumstances are generally things brought about by people. And we have uh, the, one of the lessons to learn there is that you can make something that isn't a pest into a pest if you do things wrong. Um, if you're not keeping your trees well watered, then you have them under stress and we had a problem just a couple of years ago, I think it was three or four years ago, there was an outbreak of this particular beetle species in the Coachella Valley, that they were getting into a lot of people's palm trees and doing a lot of damage. And it turned out that it was a f sort of a <laughs> an artificial circumstance. There turned out that there was one particular person who had cut down a lot of palm trees on their property and left the palm trunks to rot. And so there were hundreds of these palm trunks and they were a source of food for these beetles, which normally don't go after live trees. But because these palm trunks were laying there for such a long time and there were so many of them and they were so yummy and delicious for these beetles, it built up a very large population of these beetles and they flew away from the, that particular spot and everywhere downwind that those beetles blew, they got into people's palm trees and started attacking them. So it was a man-made problem and not one that would ever have occurred under natural circumstances. You wouldn't have a concentration of hundreds of dead palms all in one place at the same time under normal circumstances. So if that person had done the right thing and disposed of all those dead trees properly and rapidly, then none of that would have happened. And hopefully there won't be any repeats of that particular circumstance. So that species of beetle, even though it does attack our native palms and it's a you know, it's a, it's a natural occurring species in our area. It's, like I said, generally pretty rare and we shouldn't necessarily have to worry about that thing being a pest or a problem. So that's the case where something that isn't supposed to be a pest can be one if you do things the wrong way. And now for the third case, and this is the one that's a little bit more 
of a, an issue for people, we have another beetle that is not native to our area, but it does also feed on palms. And this is this one. This is the Brazilian palm weevil, Rhinchophorus palmarum. And that is also a fairly large beetle. And that particular set of specimens in this box, they're all from San Diego, not from Brazil. So we have a problem sitting on our doorstep. They have not yet, at least as far as we know, managed to make it um, from San Diego over to uh, anywhere else, but they're, uh, they're big beetles and they can disperse and they can do a lot of damage and they can fly pretty well. What you see in this photo here is what a palm tree looks like when it's been killed and attacked by these weevils. You, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily instantly know that that is a dead palm or at least one that is never going to recover. They'll look at it and they say, well, it's still got its leaves on it. They know that looks fine. Um, if you know better, <laughs> you'll realize that that palm is not long for this world. And so we have one faculty member, Mark Hoddle, who is, is the director of our Center for Invasive Species Research. And he's been going down to San Diego and Tijuana and checking out the situation there and trying to get people's attention to the fact that here is this incredibly devastating pest that's sitting on our doorstep and no one's doing anything about it. No one's giving any funding for research into it. No one's trying to work on biological control measures or anything like that. And he's been pretty much unsuccessful so far at getting anyone to support any sort of research or investigation into this. And so he's been doing most of this work on his own time and out of his own pocket. If you look, however, at the list of species of palms that they already are known to attack, um, this particular thing goes after uh, some rather <laughs> important palm trees that occur in our area, especially in the Coachella Valley, which includes, you will see here, date palms. Date palms are a preferred host of this beetle, and they will wipe the date palm industry out if they are not controlled um, effectively. And the date palm people, who ha either they don't know that this is happening, or they haven't um, really gotten um, geared up to to deal with it, but it still has not really crossed people's come to people's attention, and they haven't done very much about it. Uh, like I said, the research that Dr. Hoddle's been doing has not been getting funded. It includes some fun stuff like doing flight tests, and this has generated some very disturbing news, and that's how far these beetles can fly. And if you look at this chart, um, they have no problem flying um, about 30 miles in a day. And they have a data point here that shows, here's this one particular female. She was able to fly 93 miles without stopping. That is more than enough for them to get from San Diego to the Coachella Valley in one shot. And they've been in San Diego now for a couple of years. In fact, if you look at this particular graphic, the urban palm surveillance of 491 palms in San Diego, um, the percentage of dead palms as of August of 2020, which was almost exactly a year ago, 50% of the palms were already dead a year ago. I'm sure that number has not gone down and nobody in San Diego seems to be paying much attention to this, even though it is a visible thing. You look at those, the palms on that lower photo, that's a dead palm and they haven't been removed. They're standing there and they're acting as just a source for more of these beetles to grow and feed and produce more beetles and they can fly away and infect other trees. So they are going to be a source and it is probably, probably just a matter of time if they're not already in the Coachella Valley before they actually do arrive. And this is something that 
hasn't really raised many red flags with anybody so far. So what we have here is a lesson in um, not paying attention to what's going on until it's too late. Uh, this is something that we would be very, we would be well served um, to get some attention drawn to this and to get some funding behind it because taking care of this particular problem is not going to be easy. These beetles live deep in the core of the crown of the palm trees where they can't easily be reached with any sort of pesticides and we don't really have any sort of good feel for any biological control agents. The only thing that they have found so far is species of flies that they found in Brazil that will attack and kill the uh, larvae of these beetles and bringing an insect from a foreign country like that here to the US and trying to release them is a process that takes several years. You can't just bring an insect in and let it go. It has to be studied in the laboratory to make sure that it doesn't attack other things and you won't have all sorts of collateral damage when the insect is released into the environment. And that is not a simple prospect. Um, it can take you know, five to 10 years to get something like that done. And especially in a case like this, these palm weevils are not the kind of insect that is very easy to rear in a laboratory, given that what they feed on is the crowns of palm trees. It's a little bit tricky to make some sort of an artificial situation that you can have in a quarantine laboratory that uh, mimics the conditions and, and so, such for raising a bunch of these weevils. Um, Dr. Hoddle's trying to get that figured out and that's not a simple prospect. So we may be many years from a point where we could be able to control these weevils and they are literally on the doorstep right now. So we might not have any time at all before something becomes a problem. We don't know. There's not that, there's not a survey program. There's no one out there looking for these things right now. So they could be in the Coachella Valley already and we might not know it yet. And we might not know it until it's too late. So that, that sort of thing is something to, that we have to be concerned about. Um, I just, it, it's still, you know, you, you're going to say, well, how is it, how could it be that, you know, no one is doing anything about this? I can't really answer that question. Um, that's, that's a, that's a concern um, and a problem. We have, we have something that is an obvious issue that is, that we're facing and we don't have much attention being devoted to it. And that's one of the reasons I thought this would be a good thing to bring up for this particular presentation, because there's there's a lesson to be learned in there. Whether we will all collectively learn that lesson before it's too late is a different question. Um, and again, this is this is something that um, something to think about. You know, we we have a tendency as a society to be a little bit slow on the uptake when it comes to things that are um, invasive species and especially when they're things like insects which are not necessarily very obvious. We were just, um, I just got a specimen in one of our student collections um, just th on Thursday. They turned in a specimen that they had collected near San Diego of the, the citrus root weevil which is an invasive species from the Caribbean that has uh, pretty much done a few million dollars worth of damage to the Florida citrus industry and is just now starting to spread into Southern California. And this is the first specimen that I have seen locally. And it was one of our students who brought it in and not somebody who's from the USDA or CDFA or one of our professors, just some student out there catching bugs. And he found one near the elementary school in his neighborhood. So we have a problem and that's not going to be the kind of thing that's e easy to stay on top of. And we have a lot of problems like that. We've got all sorts of invasive insects that show up in Southern California every year and 
some of them are harmless and some of them are not. And in the case of this weevil here, we are looking at something that is probably not going to be harmless at all. So I think that will cover most of what I had to say. And I bet that there will be a fair number of questions and I will do my best to answer them. And thanks for your attention. All right, thank you uh, very much for the presentation, Doug. Um, I have, let's see, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, so uh, as far as this, um, um, the invasive beetle, how would we go about monitoring for the beetle? I mean, do we, can we do, tell them where they are before the palm trees start to look like that or? Um, I have somewhere in this talk that Dr. Hoddle passed me, there was something about putting out baits. Um, you can put out, you can put out traps that the beetles will go to. So you can actually trap these things and find them, but nobody's doing that right now. Um, it it's, you, you know, somebody has to make these traps, build them, distribute them and so forth. And that takes time and labor and money and nobody's doing it right now. All right, well, maybe someone is listening here who uh, wants to do something about that um, and has some resources to do it with. Well, I would urge them to contact Dr. Hoddle. I, I had thought I'd shared the, um, there's, there's also that, <laughs> which maybe can help people. There was, a, there was a URL for the Center for Invasive Species Research website somewhere. Um, that I thought could be shared. But he's he's been trying to get information on this and get people's attention and he hasn't had much luck so far. Um, I'm a little puzzled as to why nobody seems to be on top of it, but that's mm. that's how it's going. Yeah, it seems like a familiar story, unfortunately. Um, uh, so I had another question or maybe just a request uh, could you um, stop sharing your screen and then oh. show us the the beetle collections again up close so we can get a better look? Were... Ah, I didn't. I, that's right. I forgot my camera wasn't being sh shown. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. No so worries. This is the original beetle that I was showing. This is the new species of Dinocoma, which is um, a lot smaller than that native beetle, which is the, the palm borer. And then there was the uh, palm weevil, which is almost as big as the palm borer, but not quite, but that's still a very large beetle. And these, like I said, these are all specimens that Dr. Hoddle collected in San Diego just recently. So we have a problem. <laughs> it's demonstrable at this point. So um, sort of picking up from there, I'll go to one of the questions in the Q&A and folks, if you have questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A so we can uh, answer them live. Um, so the question is, what is it about the beetles that make them so well equipped to attack palm trees? I mean, those, we're like, those two different beetles, they look kind of similar over Zoom, but they're in totally different families, right? So yeah. what, um, what makes them palm uh, tree specialists in particular? Palm trees are a lot easier to chew into than normal trees. And more of the tissue in a palm tree is edible and nutritious than a regular woody tree. I mean, in a woody tree, the wood is very, very difficult to digest. And it's, it's difficult to, to physically chew into, and it's difficult to extract any nutrition out of it. Um, palm trees are a lot squishier. Um, they got a lot of fluid in them. There's a lot more sugar in there, and and the and the. I mean, if you if you try to like take a chainsaw into a palm tree, they're sort of spongy and very wet. Um, there's you know they're they're a much easier resource for these things to get into, and that's why they get so big. A lot of you know you can get a lot of small wood boring beetles, especially things that live under bark. Um, but these guys, they just go right into the crown where it's just it's just it's just beetle heaven. 
Um, they get very big. I mean, you don't, there's hardly any weevils in the world bigger than those. And that palm borer is, like I said, by an orders of magnitude, it's the biggest member of its family in the world. It's because it's eating a resource that's basically unlimited food. Um, let's see, we have a couple more, just kind of sticking with the palm beetles for a second. Um, a few questions about kind of the, the ecology, life history. Do we know if there's a temperature range um, that the invasive Brazilian ones are um, able to last in? I mean, are, are, are they like San Diego climate? particularly that keeps them out of the Coachella Valley maybe or out of the desert regions? Um, having lived in Brazil for several years, I can vouch for it getting quite warm there. Um, and also, I didn't go into some of the other species of the palm weevils that are in the same genus. The palm growing areas, especially the date palms in the Middle East have been devastated by a different species in the same genus. It's a slightly smaller species. It's colored a little bit differently. It's called the red palm weevil. That thing has been an absolute nightmare for the date, other date palm growing regions in the world. Um, and it's through the Mediterranean and the Middle East, you know, palm, all the palm trees and, and, you know, in Spain and places like that, they're being wiped out by that other species of palm weevil. Mercifully, the one small invasion we had of that species was very temporary. Um, it doesn't appear to have gotten established. Unfortunately, the one that's coming up from <laughs> the Brazilian one doesn't seem to be show any sign of stopping at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, if the other species is any indication of what we're up against, it's going to be a problem because they haven't been able to get a handle on that over in Europe or in the Middle East. Um, they, you know, the Dr. Hoddle was flown over to Saudi Arabia and visited some of the areas over there. They were willing to pay um, a fair bit to bring him in to consult on this because they had, he said, he said that they showed him one area that was at least the size of a football field and was stacked at least 10 deep with the trunks of all of the dead date palms that they had accumulated there. Um, it's a it's a massive massive problem, um, and California has so far dodged that particular bullet, um, and it's you know it's doubtful whether we will be able to maintain ourselves secure from these weevils very much longer. Um, and then uh, there was a question about the on your chart of the species that they affected, um, you had Washingtonia species on there. So that includes, I assume, both the native California fan palm and the Mexican fan palm. Mm -hmm. And there are a, it's a little questionable how, how much they will use those hosts. They don't seem to be the preferred hosts, but they seem to be capable of attacking them. Um, that's, what, that's what Dinopady does attack. So the right. native beetle goes into the Washingtonias and and only strays into the others, whereas the weevil seems to do sort of the reverse. So like if there's a date palm around, they'll go for the date palm, but they, if nothing else is there available, they might go to the Washingtonians. Yeah, and they can, you know, if they if they can survive and breed in the Washingtonians, the, that'll just act as a source for them to expand their range and invade other places and other species. There's a lot of different palms that they'll feed on. Yeah, that could be pretty scary. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, imagine Southern California with no palm trees. That's not a pretty picture. And it's it's something that we actually may be looking at down the road. Um, let's see. Got a couple of questions about the collections. Um, and you mentioned the large collection that uh, you see Riverside has that you're um, curating. Um, if folks are amateur collectors or and want to help make submission submissions to the museum or they found a beetle maybe that they think might be a problem, um, are you the person they should talk to or how do you recommend folks going about that? 
Well, I'm the only full-time person here. So um, yeah, I'm the person to talk to. Um, we do take donations of research grade specimens. And I, I, I use the phrase research grade, blah, 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 research grade um, very specifically because in order to use a specimen for like, I mean, we have specimens in our collection that are from the 1800s. There's a certain way that the specimens have to be labeled and preserved in order to keep them viable for research purposes for long periods of time. And the most important thing um, is that they not be rotted or broken and that they have a label that has um, when and where they were collected. So the information as to when and where they were collected is pretty much the essential thing. We have some very old specimens in the collection that don't have interesting data on them that might just say California or Los Angeles or something like that. Those are almost useless for any sort of research purposes. It's stuff that has you know, pinpointed information. In that respect, things like that, you know, that eye naturalist photo of that dinacoma that I showed, that's fantastic. Even though we don't have that specimen, it's almost as good as if we did because we can see it fairly well from that photo and we have the exact geographic location where it was collected and the exact date and that's useful information. We can work with that. Um, it, you know, and the, even in the absence of the physical specimen. So I mean, if you're, a, if you're a photographer, just contribute your insect photos to iNaturalist like that, and it will, it will really be helpful. Um, I am working on another paper where we were documenting the distribution of native bees in Southern California, just based on iNaturalist images. Um, there are tens of thousands of photos that people are taking of various bee species in Southern California. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's just a massive amount of information that you can get that way. And that's, a, that's something you can contribute. Um, the, having the specimens is good for vouchers. We have, uh, I just had a guy from, who lives in uh, uh, the Chiricahua Mountains in Arizona and he donated three boxes of bee specimens to us. Um, and that was, that was fantastic. It's really good to have specimens like that um, to add to the collection. Do bear in mind that we don't have public displays. So if you're looking to like browse insects, you know, see insect collection up close and personal, it's not really designed for that. I mean, when you have 4 million specimens, you can't put them all on display. It's just like having a library or, you know, I at the even at, even in its best situation, the collection like this could be like an art gallery. And if you know anything about how an art gallery works, they only display a very tiny portion of their holdings. The back rooms of the art gallery have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that they can't have on display at any one time because the gallery itself can only hold just so much. And it's the same here. We only have, you know, 12 display cases to put bugs in and we have 4 million insects. There's no way to put all of that into just 12 display cases. So it's, you know, it's mostly for research purposes. If you're a researcher, then yeah, this is the place to come. Um, if you're looking to browse insects, it's not really set up for that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other kinds of research that goes on um, using those collections? Well, what the examples I gave here tonight give you know a few pointers for the kinds of things that come out of that. One of the things that goes on here is species discovery. I mean, like I said, we're discovering you know something like two species every week, um, and that's something that all of the collections in the world um, do. I mean, there there are more new insect species being discovered every day than there are any, uh, you know, all of the other animal types combined. And so we're just one of the collections that do that sort of thing. We also act as, like I showed you the specimens that Dr. Hoddle gave us, you know, that, that box of weevils, those are research vouchers. So people who are in our department and are doing research, they deposit the specimens from their research here in the collection and they can be made available to other researchers in perpetuity. I mean, we have specimens that were collected in 
in the 1920s when they were just doing the pioneering work on biological control. You know, this was UCR was the place where modern biological control techniques were really developed. Um, and we still have all of the research material from those people in the 1920s who were doing that work. They're all still here in our collection and somebody who needs to know, you know, what were these guys looking at, you know, when they said species X, you know, are those specimens actually species X? Were they really species Y? Well, we've got the specimens, they're still here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a repository for research vouchers and, you know, that's a major thing that we do. And just like a library, um, we loan specimens. So at any given time, we may have anywhere from 10 to 50,000 specimens from our collection that are you know, off in Sweden or Australia or Japan or you know, Brazil, various places you know, and, you know, throughout the country. We have people who come to the collection and do their research here um, and we send material to other places. It's gotten a little bit easier now with the digital era to send just data to people if that's all that they need is information from the specimens or if they need to see photographs um, of the specimens, we can just take a photograph without having to actually send the specimen itself. So, you know, we, we serve a variety of purposes in that respect. And, you know, we can identify things that are sent to us from homeowners and such. I get at least three or four emails a day from people around California and sometimes from other parts of the country. I just got one from uh, somebody in Georgia yesterday. They had a paper wasp nest outside their door and they wanted to know what it was. And mm -hmm. they found my address on the internet and sent the photo to me. So I knew what it was. I told them what it was and what they could do about it. Um, so we're, you know, a collection like this is a support resource. We support other people. Myself, I don't do a lot of research. I don't publish a lot of research, but I help a lot of other people get their research done. And that's a very important job and I'm, I'm glad to be doing it. And I'm, I like to think that I'm good at it. Um, and doing things like the, this presentation, you know, public outreach is part of that. Yeah, that's a, a tremendous resource for sure. Um, and you talk a little bit more about, uh, we had a question here about uh, the evidence that you're using to determine a new species. So if you have a bunch of different cases, June, or June beetles, let's say, in the Dinocoma genus, how can you tell that one is a different species from another? Um, that's going to depend to some extent upon the group of insects that you're looking at. For certain things, there's going to be lines of evidence that will work for that group, but not necessarily work for another group. Um, in the case of these June beetles, the person I, I mentioned, uh, Dave Hawks, is the authority on this group. He does dissections of all these things as he gathers them. And it turns out that the male genitalia are actually very species specific. This particular group of scarab beetles has um, there's, there's this model, a theoretical model called the lock and key theory in evolutionary biology about how species recognition sometimes involves the actual mechanism by which the males and females physically join together. And if they don't fit together properly, then the female will reject the male. And this seems to be the case for this group of beetles because every species has the male genitalia are different in the shape and structure. There are other groups of insects where that's absolutely not the case, where the male genitalia are identical across all of the species. And so you have to find other features to use in those particular groups. It might, might in some cases, the only way that you can determine which species are which is through the use of genetic tests. Um, and that's one of the things that's leading to a real proliferation of the number of new insect species being described is that there's an increasing number of researchers who are getting the kind of funding that they need to do genetic analysis of their taxa. And so there's a fellow who's an associate of our collection who just published a paper. I think it was something like 
they had a genus of wasps, little parasitic wasps, and that from Central America that had six or seven described species in the genus, and they just published a paper describing over 300 new species in that one genus, all based on doing their genetic analysis, you know, just gene barcoding. There's virtually no difference between a lot of those species, or if there is differences between them, they're really, really subtle. And so they didn't even bother to write descriptions of the taxa. They just published the sequences of these things and said, you know, this is the, these are the characters that define this taxon. It's all genetics. Mm. And if that proliferates, then we're going to go from 27,000 insects in California to about 27, you know, 270,000. Um, it, it generally magnifies by a factor of about 10 um, the number of species that you think you have, because it turns out that there's a lot of genetic differentiation that takes place um, that doesn't lead to visible things. So, like I said, it varies from insect group to insect group. In some cases, you know, things like butterflies, you just look at the wings. You know, it could hardly be easier, but not everything's that easy. Yeah. Is there a, it just brings up a question, is there like a international body or does UCR belong to a group that sort of helps to um, catalog all of that officially in one place or is it? Um... There is no central repository for that sort of thing. We don't have you would think that by now we might actually have a list somewhere of all those species on earth and we don't. We are in fact not even close to having a compiled list of all the species on earth. And the reason we're not even close is because of insects mostly. Um, and actually arachnids might even be worse in terms of the proportion um, of things that have been named relative to what's, what's available. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. I mean, we have com pretty much complete catalogs of things like fish. We have pretty good on the terms of plants and birds and things like that. But insects, there's only selected groups that we have a really good feel for. Um, and generally speaking, no centralized resource that compiles all that information. And that's un it's unfortunate, but it's true. All right, we have a few kind of um, maybe general um, insect questions. Uh, someone wants to know what's the difference between a beetle and a weevil? A uh, weevil is just one type of beetle. It is, however, pretty much the largest group of beetles in terms of species. So I think it's something like one out of every five species of animal on the planet is a weevil. And one out of every two species is a beetle. <laughs> and that's uh, and that's just a present estimate when you when you take those little tiny wasps and things like that into consideration if the genetic people ha have their say um they're going to make a much bigger proportion of the total than uh than they presently represent and beetles are going to get pushed way down in that pie chart <laughs> right now right now the the beetle share of the pie chart is almost 50 percent of all life on earth and that's probably reflecting just our poor state of understanding because there's a lot more people who collect beetles. Who can blame them? <laughs> um, and then the uh, question about the predators. So my understanding is for all three, maybe of the species that we've looked at tonight, they kind of are only are out and active as adults for a very short period of time. And most of the time they're larva down in the ground or in a palm tree. Um, that's certainly true for the Dinocoma and probably for the Dinopady. For those weevils, um, that's not entirely clear, but they're not the kind of thing that we have predators for around here. I mean, those are big, tough beetles. Um, I, 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 mean, I don't know if you can, you can see, you know, that, that beetle is not, you know, they're, they're on pins and it was almost impossible to get the pins into those specimens. Those mm. things are, are almost like iron. They almost bend the tips of the pins. In fact, we actually had a batch of pins that we had to throw away because they would not go into those beetles. They mm. were very badly made pins. That's beside <laughs> the point. But it, it means that those beetles are almost impossible for any predator to eat. We don't have 
really big birds and really big lizards that are going to munch on those things, at least not in any large numbers. So we don't have good effective predators that will feed on those things to keep them under control. That's why we need something that will attack the eggs or the larvae of those beetles like those flies do. That's and that that was a lucky discovery that those things were around. It had only because we had contacts in Brazil. Um, but like the that Asian palm weevil, we don't know of anything that attacks those. That's why it's been more of a problem in the Middle East. So we have we have one glimmer of hope for the for the Brazilian palm weevil. But that, like I said, that's that's something that's several years down the road before that becomes um, even viable as a control measure. And presumably, if they found out that the fly also would go after the native palm boring beetles, they would have to abandon it anyway, right? They, yeah, it's hard to say. Maybe. <laughs> it, you would think that they'd be more cautious about that. I mean, they, they've gotten burned a couple of times when things got brought in and released prematurely, and then they attack native species. Um, but that was, you know, we've gotten better and better and better at controlling that sort of thing. So... You know, we're hopefully not going to make that sort of mistake again. Good. At, um, the, the point about the predators uh, brings to mind. Once I once saw a owl pellet with an almost intact palm boring beetle, um, just like taking up the whole pellet. <laughs> like the, the insect had stayed together, and the owl ate it and then regurgitated it back up almost intact. So yeah. Tough. Yeah, they are, and there there are there are genuine reports of people who have found beetles that have passed like the, through the entire digestive tract of a predator and come out the other end and escaped. Mm. This, this, just a, a paper published a few years ago that documented that and that it happens more than once that this is like a routine thing. These beetles just, you know, fold themselves up, ride out the digestive tract and when they get pooped out, they go scurrying off. <coughs> Um, let's see, I had a question, maybe an interesting question. I don't know if you've got an answer, but um, <laughs> heard stories about the Kuia, the native people in the Coachella Valley, um, using fires to uh, maybe increase fruit production in the native uh, fan palm oases. Uh, do you know whether that would have had an effect on the palm boring beetles or maybe whether the Kuia would have done anything with the palm boring beetles when they were there? Um, under normal circumstances, those those native palm borers are not a problem until the tree is on its way out. They will almost never attack a healthy tree. So if you've got a healthy palm tree, they're they're not going to have those beetles going after them. It's be, it's trees that are under stress, and so you know under the present circumstances where we've had, you know, in the last decade, we've had a number of really significant drought years. And we are looking if, you know, assuming that these trends indicated by the, by the global climate models are genuine, we're going to have more and more years like that. And that's, a you know, it's not how historically things went around here. You know, the really bad years were much more scattered. They're fewer and further between. Now they're coming with greater frequency. And so beetles like that are going to become more of a problem now than they have probably ever been in the past. So I think, you know, if the native people had to contend with them, they wouldn't have had to contend with them except in trees that were already dying and not very often. Um, let's see, we've got... But we've sort of answered most of the other questions. A couple more. Uh, oh, I just saw something. You kind of, oh, that's something else. Um, okay, so is there a time of year that the weevils would be active or that people would be more likely to see them? Um, I think that this is about the time of year when they are active. Let me check the labels on these specimens. Um, this was collected on the third of august of 2018 so yep we're that's when almost that's where almost all these were collected was mm -hmm. in august 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 yep <laughs> so yeah we're heading we're heading to peak weevil time 
Um, so maybe we'll get to dodge the bullet one more year. It remains to be seen. Oh, I will point out, nobody asked this question, but I'll raise it anyway because I get asked it all the time. Murder hornets. There <laughs> sure. haven't been any sightings this year yet. In so the every, so here so here's a case where the media went absolutely nuts. There's like all around the world, people went just berserk about these murder hornets and, and all you know what a problem they were gonna be. And yet here it is two years after they were first sighted and there hasn't been a single sighting this year and nobody's talking about them. And yet here we have an actual invasive problem that could like wipe out every palm tree in Southern California and the media hasn't done anything about it or said anything about it. So where's the perspective? I think if you name them murder weevils, you might get some more. Yeah. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, okay, I think I have a good question to go out uh, on here about um, maybe uh, a connected issue about public attention. Um, recent reports of ongoing mass insect extinction globally. And uh, what are some specific things that you can recommend as us as um, you know, citizens maybe to help protect insect biodiversity uh, here in the Coachella Valley or wherever we're listening from? Okay, that's a very context dependent thing because most of the places where these studies have been done that have shown these very large declines in insect numbers have been in human disturbed areas and in that context it's not really surprising where we have more pesticides more pollutants um, we're decreasing the plant diversity in a lot of these habitats. And so that insect diversity and numbers are dropping in human affected areas is not really that surprising. Although the magnitude of the effect is perhaps a little bit more stark than people imagined it would be. Native habitats are not being surveyed that much. And they, if you go out into places that really aren't being disturbed, most of them are still pretty intact and the insect diversity and numbers are still pretty good. The thing that is changing and that's changing in patterns that are a little hard to predict and get a feel for is because of climate change. And so a lot of things are moving out of their normal ranges and they're shifting around where they live. And if they shift too far, they can, they can get disconnected from their prime habitats. I mean, if, if the climate is changing faster than the plants can move, then the insects that feed on those plants are gonna find themselves in a mismatch where the, where the temperatures are not good for the things that they're feeding on, but the things that they're feeding on haven't moved somewhere else because everything, everything hinges on that, you know, that, that lower part of the food pyramid is the plants and the plants don't move around that much. So climate change is definitely a major monkey wrench in the system. And if there, if there really is a threat to insect diversity, it's because of that particular issue, how things get thrown off. And just to give the, the one example that I know of in the Northeastern US, they've been doing some pretty good stuff. And it's from museums like ours that have lots of specimens going back hundreds of years that we can track this sort of thing. Flowers in the spring are blooming much, much earlier than they ever used to. They're, they're, they're almost a full month ahead of what the, when the blooming periods were a century ago. And the plants are now blooming before any of their pollinators are coming out of the ground. And the pollinators, when they come out, their host plants aren't there because they're already dead. And so both the plants are suffering because the plants aren't getting pollinated and the pollinators are suffering because they're not getting fed. And so there's a, there's a loss there that is not because we're doing anything specific to the habitat or because we're killing the plants directly or killing the insects directly, but just the ecology is being thrown out of, of whack. And so this is something that, you know, it's very hard for any individual person to contribute one way or the other to, to that particular thing, but it's something that we, we all have a collective responsibility to act, you know, and, and push for people to, you know, address these sorts of issues. 
you know, we have to, we have to try to do something because we're not on a good trajectory right now. Yeah, at a certain point, um, you know, it's always maybe always a good idea to plant uh, native things in your yard and not use pesticides yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But you also yeah. need that um, collective global action to take place, right? Because otherwise, right. The climate change is going to still be a problem um, for everything. Well, <laughs> uh, thanks again, Doug, for the presentation. Sure. That was really fascinating. And um, hopefully, uh, not only gave people some new information, but some um, actions that they could take or some, some um, issues that they should be aware of in the community and here. Food for thought, at least. At least, yes. Um, and thank you all for coming and uh, listening tonight. And uh, let's see, our next Wild Coachella lecture is coming up in August, and we'll be talking about those plants, the, the bottom of the food chain and some of the um, unique and interesting plants in the deserts of Southern California with uh, Dr. Naomi Fraga from the California Botanic Garden and um, some of the work that she is doing to uh, not just understand the plants, but also protect them. So we'll be talking about kind of the same kinds of issues, but for plants. Otherwise, um, again, thank you all for coming and we'll, we'll see you next time.